Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for, for coming tonight. Um, my name is Matt. I'm the techn technical art director at Nordius. And tonight, I want to talk about uh, a bunch of stuff related to how you can help creative people do a better job. Um, so I thought I wanted to be an animator. Uh, I got to college, started studying animation. Turns out I'm, I'm shit at animation. But what I found was that I was good at rigging, and rigging was something that my friends uh, did not like doing, and it wasn't a passion for them. But I was able to automate a bunch of this stuff, and from then on, I really, really got into trying to figure out ways to um, help creative people uh, make better digital art faster and easier and just in a better way. So. What we're going to talk about tonight is uh, what an art pipeline is. Uh, we're going to talk about what problems do art pipelines solve, and a little bit about uh, seven different systems that all kind of end up working together to uh, help making, no matter what type of art you're working with, uh, make the process of working with it a little bit easier. So uh, starting out, what is an art pipeline? Well. So an art pipeline is uh, basically just a series of processes, both human and uh, technological, that end up getting an idea into a game as a visual feature. Um, so the problems with art pipelines that, we, that I've seen in a bunch of the industry is that the, um, there's inconsistent data uh, and the Right, and data integrity and, and safety. So art pipelines need to be non-destructive. So if you have a process that ends up altering, say, like the input file, that's not good. It means you can't go back and, and work on that file again. It's been altered irre irrevocably. Another thing I've seen is it's difficult for people to uh, use source control. So this is something we have to have in the games industry, and I highly recommend it. Uh, this is basically the central hub where everything is stored. You get history on all the different changes. And if data isn't being pushed up to that regularly, uh, I've seen machines go down. I've seen art get lost. Um, the story I have here is I was working on Elder Scrolls Online. We wanted to, do, we wanted to use this great model that was in ZBrush for a collector's edition statue. Turns out that ZBrush file never got checked into Perforce and we ended up paying a principal uh, figure artist for two weeks to remake it. So check your stuff in, guys. Uh, and the other thing is uh, collaboration. So as people are working on things, uh, if two people end up working on the same thing, you end up in this weird situation where you have to uh, pick who's going to win. And somebody always loses, and that's no fun. So the other issue is the technical barriers to contributing. Uh, this could be just having to configure a bunch of tools. It could be uh, the performance constraints, knowing those performance constraints, keeping those up to date. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how to deal with these uh, in, in the next parts. Uh, the other part of this is when people are messing around with naming files, figuring out where they should go, uh, figuring out how to get an export from Maya into the game, uh, their artistic talent, their passion is being wasted, and it's not good for the business, and it's not good for the artists. So the last bit here is just the idea of uh, maintaining a competitive advantage. If you have a pipeline that's built around a specific uh, content creation tool like Maya or Max, uh, that can be a problem when something really cool comes out. Like say. You're working with Max, and a great new feature gets added to Maya. Or you got artists who really want to start digging into Houdini. If the entire pipeline is centered around uh, Max, that's going to be a problem. So what we're going to talk about are some ways to decouple all that so that you can have different DCCs and allow things to move forward and stay up to date. So the first system. Uh, asset management. This is effectively the backbone of the entire thing. Assets maintain the relationships between all of the different parts of uh, a game art pipeline. 
So the first thing we're going to look at is the, uh, the two data types. Basically, we have asset types, and then we have assets. An asset type is here to describe the shape of an asset, and the assets are specific things that we would talk about in conversation. I've got a bunch of gobbledygook up here, but the idea is that when uh, creating connections between different things, I use uh, something called a UUID. This is a randomly generated string that allows me to identify a specific piece of content forever. I can create a bunch of these and not have to worry about them ever colliding. Uh, the odds of that are effectively astronomical. It adds a bit of complexity, but you get a lot from this. It allows you to rename things. So if all the connections are based on uh, maintaining IDs, you can rename things and not worry about those connections breaking. Uh, it also helps out when you've got legacy data where uh, you've been working with a system, you didn't have some asset control, uh, you've got a bunch of stuff where the names actually conflict. This would allow you to identify those things individually without having to figure out and take time to rename everything. So we're going to pretend that we have a game. Uh, we're going to, it's a rock collection game. So we need to make a bunch of rocks. And in this case, we've got our rock asset type, and it has an ID. And then we've got three different rocks. But unfortunately, everything is named rock at this point. So what, what can we do about that? Naming conventions. So having a system for naming conventions other than a document on a shared drive or in Google Docs or Confluence or something means that uh, your creatives don't have to remember the structure or the rules for generating a new name. It also means user input can be validated when creating a new name. Uh, you can use this system to prevent collisions. If it's centralized, you can just keep a running incremented number in order to make sure that a new name is always unique. And then by tracking uh, name uh, conventions, you can update uh, all those things that are already named uh, when the convention actually changes. So having, not having to spend a lot of time figuring out the perfect naming convention for a game that's going to end up lasting years can really reduce friction in the beginning and keep the early momentum. So the parts of a naming convention are a name template. Uh, this describes the pattern that should be used to, dis to construct the name. And this is going to reference one or more name parameters. And the name parameters describe the data uh, expected as input for generating a new name. These have different types. It could be a string, it could be a number, it could be the counter thing I was talking about earlier. So when we apply this to the rock data, it looks a little something like this. So we have our uh, rock asset convention, and we have a simple pattern here. So the pattern looks a lot like uh, we just have this base name, and that's going to be our parameter. And it's going to then just throw rock on the end. So the base name is a user string, which means it's going to come from some tool or some sort of user input. And we can apply a validation step to this. Right now, this is just a, a regular expression. And all this is saying that in order for this to pass, it needs to be at least three characters. Uh, can't be more than 10. And it can only be uh, A through Z. Uh, if something goes wrong with this validation, this message can be bubbled up through the tooling in order to inform the user, like, hey, like, something's going wrong. You need to change something. This allows us to get to a big rock, a little rock, and an uber rock. So we go from confusion, and we start, get to little, we start to get a little bit of structure. The rock asset type now knows about a naming convention. So whenever that naming convention changes, it can do some stuff in order to keep all of the assets that it uh, represents up to date. And our assets now have names themselves. We got Big Rock, Little Rock, and Uber Rock. So what have we done so far that have actually improved things? So users no longer have to care about the structure or the rules behind a naming convention. Uh, we can change names and naming conventions and have things propagate. And the uh, 
data and reliability goes up because of those IDs. If I change a name, the whole structure doesn't fall apart. We can make mistakes. So the next bit, we've got some rocks, we've got a structure, but we don't actually have any content yet. In our, in, in games, and I think film VFX, like art data lives and dies in files. So it's super important that we figure out how to deal with this stuff. So the first thing we start out with is a backend. This is gonna be something like a Perforce Depot, a Git repo, it could be G drive, it could be a shared drive, you do you, whatever works for your studio. Be, uh, below that, we've got a location, a couple locations. One of them actually references the backend. The other location uh, references the root location. Uh, what we're doing is building a hierarchical structure for figuring out where some stuff is gonna live. Uh, in order to figure out the final path, you basically just walk up the chain, add all the parts, and you're good to go. And we'll see that in a second. Doesn't necessarily have a really one-to-one -one relationship between a directory, so a location can actually have multiple directories. The idea is we abstract a little bit the idea of a directory into something we can talk about a little more easily. So let me get down to the artifacts. And the idea here is Artifacts are some sort of file-like thing. Uh, they're definitely something that would live in Perforce, live on your hard drive. It could also be something that is in Google Drive. It could be a doc, slide deck, whatever you need it to be. So in order to try and deal with the different forms these things could take, it just sort of went with artifact. But you can kind of think file. And each artifact describes a single file, and it references a single location. What that ends up with is we get our artifact, we walk up the location chain, we know uh, the path to this thing, and we know how to deal with it. If, we, uh, if the backend is Perforce, we can invoke a Perforce API. If it's Git, we can start moving around with Git. Something interesting happens when we introduce an artifact type. Similar to where we had an asset type and an uh, asset, we have an artifact type and an artifact, multiple artifacts. So the idea here is we can actually pull in naming conventions for dealing with file names. We can also set up a default location and a default artifact. This means if I wanna say, hey, I need a new uh, mesh, I'm creating a new asset, I need a new mesh, I can go to the uh, rock mesh artifact type, and I see that, oh, cool, I have some information to figure out how to name this thing, I have a place to put it, and I even have a default file that I can copy paste and everything downstream will just start working. It's probably not gonna look great, but all of my downstream dependencies are now unlocked. And just as another example, we've got the rock source mesh base convention. In this case, uh, we're just doing rock mesh and then that index. So the idea is that this naming convention thing is a central service and it's keeping a counter for us. So whenever we go get a name, we just increment the counter and pull that back. So what we've got now is a, uh, we've got a rock with a naming convention and we start to add a little more uh, meat on these bones. So we've added a source mesh and a runtime mesh. Uh, these are both artifact types and they live on the rock. So we can look and we know that all rocks have a naming convention, they've got a source mesh, and they have a runtime mesh. And then each individual rock, big rock, little rock, and uber rock, have their own artifacts that are specific to them. So big rock uses rock mesh 000, and then the runtime mesh is actually mesh 0008. So at this point, we've added a little more functionality. Uh, we've started eliminating micromanaging files, which means we've eliminated a lot of context switching between uh, having to look in a browser, having to look in Perforce, having to look in Git. Because we also have, we know the backends, we can start interfacing with those backends on behalf of the user. When somebody wants to work on something, they can go to the asset and be like, hey, I want to work on Big Rock. Great. I'm going to go look for all my artifacts, figure out their backends, where they go and then start invoking the APIs in order to get those locally so the user can start working on them. 
So we can also uh, create new content. So the asset types know which files are involved. They know where they go. They know how to name things because of the naming conventions. So again, when we say, I want to make a new rock, we can create a whole bunch of default data that unlocks everybody downstream. We can know that it's going to be checked into Perforce or Git or whatever. And we also know that uh, there's good data in there. And we can just start working on stuff. So at this point, we've started to get a bunch of content. Uh, we need to get through to uh, search. So search is really, it's pretty straightforward. We've, the game is doing great. We need to build a bunch of content. It's starting to become difficult to find stuff. Some of the stuff is kind of old. It was somebody else is working on it. We've got new people joining. So search is really just here to uh, do a few things for us. Once we have a search layer, we can start organizing data that makes sense for the data, and not necessarily in a way that allows it to be easily findable in uh, like a file tree or something. Uh, it, we can also stop browsing file trees, and we can stop duplicate work. Because if people can find the thing that they want to work on, odds are they're not going to be like, it doesn't exist. I got to create it. So the search system is uh, basically a collection of indexes. Uh, each index has an ID, and then we give each index the type of thing that it's going to uh, hold on to for us. Uh, we also give it a type that represents the, uh, the data that we're indexing on, and then all of the, the indexed items. What this looks like is, in this case, we have two indexes. We want to track things, uh, track assets by tag, and track assets by name. So in this case, we've got some client system. Uh, we need to create a request in order to add something to an index. That's going to have an uh, index ID. It's going to have the type of thing that we're storing. It's then going to have an ID specific to the thing that we want to track. And then the data that we're going to search on later. Pass all that to the search system, figures out which index, and then throws all that data in. In this case, we're storing an asset. Uh, we're indexing on the rock uh, name, and it goes into the names index. So in order to find things, we've got a bunch of stuff in indexes. And now what I really want to do is find some stuff. So what we've got, we're like, hey, search. Uh, I want to see uh, the, find me all the assets with the name Uber in them. That goes in. The search system finds the index, starts doing the pattern match. And when we come back out, uh, we get a list of item keys. In this case, we get one, and it's the Uber Rock ID. We don't actually have anything else at this point. The search system does not know like all the guts of what this thing is. It doesn't care. It just knows that, hey, at some point, uh, this ID was passed in, and it was passed in with this name, so it matches. You go do something else with it now. So asset system get back and be like, hey, great. Here's the thing I was looking for. I'm going to go and resolve all of that information and pass it back to whatever's requesting it. At this point, uh, because we now have a way to search things, either by name, by tag, by some other metric, uh, users aren't having to dig around in folders looking for that one thing. And we've decoupled organizi organizing content from the way it makes sense for the data itself uh, from how users are going to end up parsing through all that data. Yeah. Artist context switching. They don't have to do that anymore. Right. Uh, so cool. The next thing we're going to talk about is performance constraints. So we've got a bunch of data. Uh, we know how to get to that data. And now it turns out we've added so much data that the game is running at two frames a second. So that's not so good. Uh, what we want to do now is figure out a way for us to author a bunch of different uh, constraints or tests that can uh, identify problematic content and help us do something with that. So in this case, we have a constraint, and then we have a constraint configuration. And the configuration is basically just a list of constraints. 
straight has a bunch of parameters and then a failure message that basically is supposed to be human readable. It's supposed to be a, something that will inform the user, hey, I ran into this problem. We should probably do something about this. A couple of examples. So for the rock mesh, uh, we have a maximum poly count of 9,000. And when that gets over, we have a me message that says mesh is over 9,000 polys. Uh, we get to maximum vertex influences. So if we have a bone that's weighted to, or a, we have a vertex that has too many bone influences, we'll, we'll get this error as well. And same with image. Uh, we have specific image compression con uh, constraints and image dimensions. So the idea is uh, whenever we have some data, we have some art data, we can start running it through these, uh, these tests in order, and figure out are we good to go or not. Additionally, because these are described as data, engineers can keep them updated. We can build tools off of them as well. So instead of having to go, again, to like a Google Doc or some arcane resource that may or may not be up to date, we're actually pulling this data into pulling this information into data and propagating it through the tool chain. What I mean by that is we've got our configuration, and that configuration is used by two different sources. One is the content tools themselves, so that as people are making things, they have a real-time view into whether or not their stuff is going to work. And then we have it also on the co continuous integration. So say every night, we go through and look at all the new stuff that was checked in and figure out, does it meet all of our technical constraints? In order to add this into our system, we go back to the asset system again. And this is our current state. We've got a rock asset type. We've got a bunch of different assets. And we've added a constraint on the entire rock asset type. So this is saying all rocks must conform to rock mesh constraints. But Uber Rock is special. Uber Rock is a premium rock, and it might actually have different constraints. It's going to have a higher mesh uh, count, uh, vertex count than, say, standard rocks. So we've improved uh, content creation by giving a higher probability that uh, content is correct uh, right from the start because we've integrated this with the DCCs. And that when uh, we have incorrect data, it's identified early and automatically. We don't want our QA staff to have to deal with trudging through and validating the technical aspects of resources. They should be looking at harder to find problems. And incorrect doesn't mean wrong. What it means is that it's the start of a conversation between art and engineering. If we put Uber Rock in and it was, uh, didn't meet the art director's requirements, then we can start having a conversation about, hey, we should probably special case this. It's important. And then changes to performance constraints can be previewed and quantified. So if I change the constraints, I can run all those tests and see how these changes are going to impact the pipeline. If I change uh, the constraints and actually start slimming things down, that means I'm possibly creating a whole bunch of work for the art team that they may not be expecting. It's good to know that up front. The next bit is going to be workflows. So a workflow is uh, the idea that uh, people are actually involved in this process. Go figure, right? So what we want to know is who's involved in a content pipeline, how do they contribute to a pipeline, and when in that pipeline do they contribute. So a role is a, a type of contributor. So this is going to be uh, an art director, it could be an art lead, it could be an artist. It's just, uh, what it, it's not a specific person. It is, it is just the, effectively the title. It's art director, it's artist. Then we have a task. Is this is just something that needs doing. Not a lot of explanation there. What we are not doing here is tracking, we're not building a task tracking system. This is intended to be used with something else, something like JIRA or some other task management system. Uh, and I'll get into a bit more detail there. So the high level, we have a workflow type. Again, similar, asset type, artifact type, workflow type. Uh, then uh, that has a collection of task types. Each task type has a description. It's got the role of the person who's basically going to be executing. 
And then we have all the stakeholders involved. So if we've got a piece of concept art, we'd have concept artist as the contributing role, and we'd have the art director and potentially uh, uh, creative director as stakeholders. We also have a set of dependencies. So if this task depends on other stuff, we can start building those relationships. So here, we've got the create rock workflow. So we need a design brief, we need to create a concept, and we need to create a mesh. And in this case, we've got uh, tasks that describe these things. Uh, we know that the game designer is gonna be executing on the design brief and that they report to the lead designer and lead artist. That then leads to the create concept. And we know it leads to that because create concept has a dependency on the design brief. And once we get to the concept, it's concept artist, lead designer, create mesh, same thing. So that's describing just how anything is made. Once we get down into the specifics, we get down to a specific workflow. This is getting down into specific tasks. And then the PMT ID is just the project management tool ID. This is where you would actually put a reference to the actual JIRA task. If you note, we don't have the contributor anymore because that's actually gonna be living in the JIRA task. Stakeholders are still here because it tends to not be tracked. I haven't seen test systems that do that, so we keep it here. And again, we're looking at the dependencies that are the specific tasks that this is dependent on. So looking at, this is how we would uh, create the Uber Rock. So we say, hey, I want a new asset. It's gonna be called Uber Rock. All of this stuff gets created automatically because we know it's the, work, the workflow. In this case, we know Marco and Maya are uh, gonna do design brief review. Uh, Marco and Maya are also doing the concept review and then Marco's doing the review for uh, the mesh itself. So again, we start pulling another system into asset management. Asset management is uh, the hub for all of these systems. This is our state. We have naming convention, source mesh, runtime mesh, uh, and the constraints, and now we add a workflow. So at this point, what we can do is look at this and go, I want a new rock. Great, I'm gonna create all the files for you automatically. I'm gonna create all your tasks automatically, and I'm gonna figure out who those tasks could be assigned to. So we all can also use performance constraints and workflows. So the constraint, again, is the parameters and failure message. Now we can add the fix workflow. So if we have a set of tasks that describe how to fix a particular type of content, whenever we get down into continuous integration and reporting, somebody can review that report and then click a button and say, hey, fix, 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 uh, don't fix, 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 fix. We can then look at the workflow for that asset and start creating those tasks automatically. So what's we, what have we added? We've started to eliminate task micromanagement. As I go through and I use the tools, uh, we can start creating tasks automatically. We can set up assignments. Uh, we know about the dependencies, so we can reflect those dependencies in whatever project management tool we're using. And then as people are working on content, we can build a tool that allows them to say, submit that content. So they say, hey, I'm done working on Uber Rock. I'm ready to submit, great. We look at the asset, we go, we find all the files that are involved, we create a change list in Perforce, they add the message, they hit commit, we submit that change list, and we change the status from in progress to done on whatever task they were working on. Tooling, uh, pretty much what I was just saying, uh, the tasks, uh, the artifacts, artifacts resolve through the asset, pulled locally, uh, task status can then be updated to in progress. And then whenever we're ready to publish, we've just got the single UI uh, that updates source control and the task status. And finally, documentation. So as I was saying earlier, like a lot of these workflows are very ad hoc. This is, they're known mainly to the art, maybe the artist, maybe the art lead, maybe not sometimes, maybe it's kind of, some people know half of it, other people know a different half. 
Once we get to this point, we can start, because it's data, we can actually visualize the entire pipeline for all of the different types of content we create across the entire game. Uh, this can lead to faster onboarding uh, because people can come in, they can actually see, oh, this is the stuff, this is what comes before me, and this is what comes after me. I need to be careful about these things because I impact these groups that come after me. Uh, and additionally, because we have tools that are starting to depend on this data, there's a higher probability that the data is actually going to be kept up to date. So no more having to remember to go update that arcane confluence page. And so again, uh, by combining workflows with performance constraints, we can rapidly react to bugs and we can evaluate how to change uh, technical constraints, or sorry, how a change to technical constraints would impact production. If we have to suddenly start uh, de-resing textures, we have to start de-resing meshes, that's gonna be a lot of work that, we, that the art department wasn't anticipating. And it would be great to be able to preview those changes and see, oh, if we drop it down, these are all the assets that are gonna be impacted. And these are all of the, the number of triangles that we're gonna have to eliminate. It can get, it can be very useful in sort of planning. So for actions, uh, this is, I think, the last uh, system. Uh, so actions describe the tools as data in order to help give uh, artists context into what they can do with stuff. So there are a handful of data types for actions. We've got uh, an environment. We've got uh, an, an environment can have a parent, so we can, again, hierarchically stack environments. And really, the environments are just defining environment variables. So we've got a variable and then a value. And the hierarchical acts as a set of, the hierarchy acts as a set of overrides. So in this case, we have a, a Maya base environment. We say a, a Maya version is zero. And then we have another one that inherits off of that. We say Maya version is 2019. Cool. So then we get down to programs. Uh, these are basically anything that you can run in some sort of context. Um, the program has a type, it's got a context, and then a path. So some way of getting to a thing to run. In the case of Maya, we know it's an executable. It can be executed in any context. And this is the path to get to it. And that path actually uses environment variables, which will come in handy in right about now. So something like a, so that we get down to actual actions at this point. So an action has an environment, it's got a, a program, it's got a thing to run, and then it might have some input data. So we say, hey, this thing needs this artifact and this artifact, and it's then going to go and touch this other artifact. The reason we would have those artifacts in there is so that we can, again, automate source control operations. So if I need to go and run uh, this action across a whole bunch of files. I know which files I'm going to have to touch so I can go get them from Perforce, make sure they're up to date, and then also check out the ones that I'm about to change. As an example of an action, we just want to run Maya. So in this case, we have the Maya 2019 environment and a program that just invokes Maya. So asset actions are kind of the same thing, but they look at asset data. So again, we've got an environment, we've got a program, and then what's a little bit different is that we have an input asset field, or a couple of input asset fields. It can be however many you need. And then on the right, we can see that in order, we want uh, an action that will compress the rock albedo. And in this case, we know we're gonna, we're gonna operate on the rock's texture config, the source albedo, and then the final runtime albedo. So we can combine actions with the performance constraints. So the constraint as it looks now, parameters, failure message, a workflow. We can add this here. So I was just talking about the uh, idea of changing the compression on a texture. If we go through and we find that, oh, hey, uh, this per, this, we've got a bunch of textures here that are not compressed correctly, we can uh, 
add a button in the tool that knows about this action, and we can just go, oh yeah, fix, 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 fix. Oh, that one's weird. I should have a conversation about that. Fix, 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 and we're good to go. I have a word of caution about trying to silently fix things. So I'm deliberately having somebody click fix, and that's because silently changing data can lead to some strange results if it doesn't go well. If it ends up, hey, it's not compressed correctly, I need to, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just silently compress it automatically. We get it in game, suddenly a bunch of people are going, whoa, this doesn't look right, what happened? It can be very confusing and time consuming to backtrack, but by having somebody go through and click fix and look at what's going on, you have a higher probability of finding the things that should actually be fixed and the ones that just shouldn't be touched. So we've added value through tooling. Tools can be more contextually aware. Uh, actions can be shared across tools, so we get a lot more reuse out of our tools. The tools are more flexible now. And by associating potential fixed actions with technical constraints, the friction of keeping content maintained goes down considerably. So as a recap, uh, we talked a little bit about artifact management, we talked about naming conventions, search, asset management, uh, performance constraints, and workflows and actions. We then we also identified the pipeline, what that is exactly. We identified some problems that are solved by having robust art pipelines, and we talked about those systems. Thanks, y'all. I have no idea what to do. This is my first day. Thank you for an excellent presentation. Sure. You are a good teacher. Thank uh, you. Yes, yeah, and then can I ask you, are you using GitHub and uh, are you using actually Agile management, Agile, or Scrum, but actually keeping this flow and sure uh, sure so uh we don't use github we use bitbucket and we host that locally within nordius yeah um so we don't have our code on a cloud provider but we do use git we also use perforce sometimes for the art data and we also use google drive for the art data so it's a bit of a cluster um in terms of Scrum and Agile, that tends to go team by team. We don't have a sort of a defined process. It, we tend to keep it organic so that teams can figure out what works best for them. And a lot of these pipelines are intentionally not, you can use it with Jira. You could use it with Rike. Like a lot of this stuff is high level enough that you can figure out which user facing tools work best for your users and then pull all that data in in such a way that uh, you, can, you can manage it no matter where it's actually coming from. Does that answer your question? Yes. Cool, cool. When you spoke about the fixing things and the buttons for that, do you have the uh, culture of commenting before or after the someone press fix that needs to comment why he did that and haha -ha. and so one. we're talking about like commit messages for yeah no we don't um, so that's one of the great things about having uh, a pipeline and a tool set that's aware of source control because f in the case of that fix we could actually automatically populate a commit message from all the data that we have. We don't actually have to rely on users to not just put fix in all the change lists and then never know what actually was fixed or in what way. Like, I've seen this. It is, source control for artists is, is hilarious because it's just update everywhere. That's all it is. It's just update for years. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I have strong opinions on source control, so <laughs> sorry.
Do you have any minions that can come and work at smaller studios <laughs> that, that is not Nordios because we have the same problem? Uh, I've seen this at every studio I've worked at. So uh, this is, the, yeah, I, it, it's a problem at Nordius. It's a problem at, like, at everywhere. Like, this is everywhere. Um, so I need to fix it at Nordius first, and then we can figure out what to do about everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I have a question. What do you use to create your pipeline management tools? So a lot of them tend to be written in Python so that they can be like any of the, the client-facing stuff, I should say, should, is written in Python so that you can pull all that into Max or Maya, whatever DCC you're working with. You also get um, desktop support, so you can kind of have your app embedded in the DCCs or within just the desktop. On the back end, you have some more options. Uh, ideally, a lot of this is written. It's simple enough. It's Rest, I think Rest works well enough for a lot of this stuff. Um, so your back ends can be written in whatever you want to write them in. If you want to write those in C Sharp, Python, JavaScript, it kind of doesn't matter because you're using the HTTP as that protocol. Um, I also don't necessarily have a problem with using C Sharp on the front end. I, my own personal experience, I can just get better looking UIs through PyQt than say WinForms. Okay, cool. Thanks, y'all. Okay.